Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part time musician who wants to go full time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. On the Profitable Musician Show, we give you practical tips and strategies to increase the income you're already making and tap into new streams so you can create more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. We also help you think like a business owner so you can keep more of the money that you make. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, author of the best-selling book, The Musician's Profit Path, and host of the popular Profitable Musician Summit. And as you can probably tell, I am obsessed with helping musicians like you to build a rock solid fan base and income foundation so you can fund the music you are driven to create, share your message with the world, and fulfill your God-given purpose as a musician without stressing out about where your next dollar is gonna come from. You've got the talent. You just need the marketing and business tools to take it to the next level. Now let's dive in to the Profitable Musician Show. I'm here with Jamie Slutsky, and we are going to talk about online tech. And I'm really excited about this because I get so many people coming to me all the time frustrated with online tech, feeling like they can't possibly master it. They want to do more things online. They want to market themselves. They want to help more people and teach and things like that online, but they feel like the tech is holding them back. So I know this is going to be a great conversation. Um, Jamie and I have known each other for a bit, um, been in a mastermind together once a long time ago. Um, and I'm excited because back then she wasn't working with musicians, but now she has found that she loves to work with musicians. So this is going to be a really cool conversation around tech and specifically tech things to help musicians make more money online. So uh, before we get there, I'd just love to know a little bit of your background, Jamie, like where are you from? Uh, how did you get started working online? And what made you decide to work with musicians? Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, Bree. Um, so I have been a techie all of my life. Um, my kids were laughing. They were looking at my book as I was uh, from when I was growing up, and it said computer scientist is what I wanted to be when I grew up from as early as second grade. I forgot all about that, and I got my degree in computer science. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. I've been in that tech space for a really long time. I worked in corporate IT, and then branched out on my own to do online web freelance work. Um, and I started that back in 2010. So I've been in this space for a long time. I live in the Seattle area, even though I grew up in Vancouver, Canada. Um, so I've got dual citizenship, which is kind of fun, but also helps me kind of have more of a global feel because I've lived in two different countries. And really, I decided to work primarily with musicians and with artists of all, you know, visual artists as well, but primarily with musicians because there is so much opportunity. There is so much opportunity for creating a difference in an in individual person's life when they bring music into their lives, into their home, into their, into their being. And I didn't see enough online music programs that were accessible to the individual. And that's really kind of where I went. Mm. Well, I love that, that you're taking that perspective because I do believe that about music. And sometimes I think it's just us crazy musicians that are obsessed with music that think that, but I'm glad to hear that civilians still think that music <laughs> is that important. Yeah. I have no musical instruments in my house. Um, we rarely have the radio on or, you know, Pandora or Spotify or anything. We're just not a very musical family. And I feel like we're actually missing out. And so I'm trying to figure out how to change that within our own lives here as well. <laughs> That's cool. Well, you can start introducing them to artists that you work with and say, hey, you know, this is my client. Check out their music. I, I started doing that with my kids when they were little, when I was, you know, running the radio station. 
and I'd get like extra CDs that I just, I always downloaded like the MP3s. I don't, I didn't need the CDs anymore. And I'd give them to my daughter and we're like, look, you know, this person, this, they sent me this signed CD and now you can have it. And she like still listens to some of their music now, which is That's fun, awesome. That was like when she was 10. So <laughs> it's <you know>. awesome. <laughs> so let's talk about, let's talk about the challenges for musicians and tech. What do you find, what do artists come to you with that they're frustrated with, that they need your help with, and that's kind of, that are kind of keeping them stuck and not moving forward into areas where they could be expanding and making income? Yeah. So most of my clients come to me because they're doing some kind of thing in the educational space. Most of them are teaching one-on-one uh, through technology or and they're thinking about, okay, I want to create an online course or I want to start a repository of learning content. So like a membership site, or I want to teach more people at once than just one person because I'm getting burned out. I'm trading time for money. I'm not making as much as I could. I don't have that work-life balance that I was looking for. So they come to me and say, how do I even start? Most of my clients have picked a platform, whether it's FaceTime or Skype or Zoom, and that is the limit of what they are using to connect with their students. And we need to go beyond. We need to figure out how we're going to create this next level of education product, um, what medium we're going to use, how it's going to look. So we go through all of that. And then we kind of come up with where everything is going to sit. And once we do that, then we start learning the technology. And I walk my clients through, this is how you record. This is how you edit. This is how you upload. This is how you interact with your clients using the platforms that we choose and things like that. So it's more about what do you want to accomplish with your students and what do you want to help your students with, then we build the container, the tech container to do that rather than building a tech container and trying to shove whatever product we think might work. But start with the students. That's kind of the big thing. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, A lot of questions I get are around like, should I just try to cobble together like what I already have or should I just build a whole nother thing from scratch, even though that could cost a lot of money? So Mm -hmm. where do you find that happy medium? The reason I'm bringing this up is because back in April, I did a workshop for the Banzoogle customers to help them. A lot of them wanted to teach online like that, you know, it was that time period where everybody was needing to move online and they didn't know how. And it gave them so many options, everything from um, you know, the, the most expensive, like going into something like Teachable or Kajabi um, or just using the website they already had on Banzoogle and like putting some content behind a password protected page, you know, mm-hmm. and using their subscriber model. And so, cause I wanted to give them ways they could get started right now. Cause a lot of times people are like overwhelmed by the idea of building this whole thing or like, it's going to be too expensive. And what if I don't get enough students? So how, how do you kind of strike a happy medium with that? Yeah, well, that's a fabulous question because one of the things that I think sets me apart from a lot of other people who are in this space is I am never going to say, you have to use this tool, you have to use this tool, and you have to use this tool. I am... um, it was funny. I actually had an assessment. Someone said, this is why you are tool agnostic. That's what I like to call it. You know, you're tool agnostic because it just doesn't matter. You're going to make things work. So if you've got software that you're using that you're comfortable with, see if you can make it work without too much struggle, 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 struggles, <laughs> without too many struggles. I can't talk about my words today, but without um, too much struggle, if that piece of software that you're using, whether it's your website or um, wherever your website is held, if that can work to have just simple password protected pages, start there. 
If it can't have password protected pages, then don't go to the next increment of, okay, I have something that now has that password protected pages. Look three to six to 12 months in the future and say, what do I want to be doing and how do I want to be serving my clients at that point? And invest in your future self and in your future students. You don't have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars. You just have to invest enough that you're not going to have to invest again soon because Anytime that we invest, we're investing both time and money. And so even if something costs a lot more now and we don't have to touch the infrastructure again for four years, we're saving ourselves a whole lot of time, which allows us to make more money, to make that bigger investment more worth it. Yeah, totally. And so how do you think you kind of, where's that point in where you're building your business that like, okay, I know this thing is working. I can make this investment. Like, do you feel like there's a kind of a, a point where people reach where it's like, okay, it makes sense because this thing is definitely growing and I believe I will have students a year from now and will be mm-hmm. out more than I have now. Yeah. So I generally say that investments can should pay themselves back and be profitable within three to six months. Mm. So if you are buying into a software that is $100 a month, three months, you've paid 300. Six months, you've paid 600. If you are making more than that back and you're then always profitable, so you're making more than $100 a month once you hit that three to six month range, then it's worth the investment. If you find a piece of software that's $4,000 one-time fee, just using that as an example, then it's a matter of, okay, how long is it going to take me to get my clients to pay whatever the price point is, or how many clients do I need in order to make that work? If you have 20 people 20 students on your roster right now, and you think 30% of them or 10% or whatever number you think it's going to be are willing to convert over to whatever you're doing next, then that is an immediate uh, amount of money that you can kind of count on. So if you had those 20 clients and you determined that four of them were going to be willing to move over to whatever you're offering next, and you're charging $50 a month for it. That's $200 that is straight off the bat income that can go towards your investment. Mm, that's a great way to break it down. And, and I totally agree with that kind of break-even model. I always tried to do that with everything that I did to make sure that I could at least break even on the front um, before I invested in it. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, are there any, I know you're plat- platform agnostic, but if somebody comes to you and they're like, I have no idea, I don't know about any platforms at all. Mm-hmm. You know, are there certain ones that you recommend? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I have to. I have to have my blueprint. And I have I have two main tracks. One of them is WordPress based, uh, where we're using plugins and we're doing all sorts of that stuff that may be over a lot of people's heads, but then everything is self-contained on your site and you are in full control of all aspects of it. The other platform that I use, and I've been using this for about four and a half years now, um, coming up on five really, is Thinkific. And they are a, um, a learning management platform. And they're actually based out of Vancouver, BC, which is my hometown, which means I've gone into their office and met a bunch of those people. So that's why I'm sticking, not why I'm sticking with them, but because I have built a relationship with them. What I love about their platform is that you can do a lot with just that platform and you don't need a lot of extra pieces. Yeah, it's true. And I've, I've heard Greg speak. I really like their company. Um, Teachable is very similar and that's the one that I've used for over five years. Um, My audience knows that. So anyone that's in my academy has been in Teachable for years. So um, they're pretty similar. So I I encourage you to join Teachable. It's kind of the same as Thinkific, pretty similar like organization of it and stuff. 
Yeah, they they have a very similar um, student feel. Like the feel for the students is very, very similar. And I think that if you follow Brie and you're doing this stuff, Teachable is going to serve you just the same as if you were like on my list first, so to speak. Um, and I suggested Thinkific. I don't think that there's a whole lot of difference um, if you're starting with something to use either one of them. Yeah. And so what, and what do you recommend for the email side? Because- I think when we go into this, people are like, okay, I need a platform, but then maybe they're not thinking about, I need a way to communicate with my students and I need a way to market my program and all that. Yeah. So email marketing is a really important piece. And I uh, generally recommend either ConvertKit or ActiveCampaign. Mm -hmm. And there's a few different reasons why I recommend one or the other um, for, for my students. Most of my clients these days, I have been recommending ConvertKit to because their, um, the layout of their website is a little bit more uh, leaning towards the creative, um, the creative brain rather than the well, analytical brain. And they are brain. focusing a lot on creatives right now. They're really doing a lot with musicians, which is, is interesting. Yeah, no, they definitely are leaning into the creative and I, I've seen it and I find that my clients generally enjoy using that platform more than they enjoy using active campaigns. So even though I personally use active campaign, I do think that uh, ConvertKit is probably a better fit for most of my clients. I would agree because I use ConvertKit and I love it. And I, <laughs> I've just realized I've been in there almost five years now because I was looking back like my oldest ones were 2016. I'm like, wow. I can't believe I've been on this platform this long, but it's, it's a really good, really good platform. Um, let's see. So let's talk about a lot of people are doing one-on-one -on -one teaching. You know, when we first mm -hmm. went into this stage of the pandemic and I was like explaining to people that are teaching one-on-one -on -one in person, like you can really keep doing this. Don't worry. You can transition your students over to Zoom or or, you know, Facebook messenger rooms or whatever you like to do. Um, and they, and a lot of people have done that and, and that's awesome. Um, but maybe they're getting overwhelmed. Maybe they're, and I know how this is. Cause when I was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, I started to feel like I had no time. I had no time <laughs> on my own, you know, people were booking into my calendar and I had no control <laughs> over my time and it stressed me out. So you know, I think we're always looking for ways to, to streamline and to be able to do things where we're not completely trading time for money. So how do you help people make that transition? Yeah, well, that is generally speaking a big transition point for a lot of people because it is new and unknown. So there is definitely some mindset work that goes into it about just like, okay, yes, I can be successful and yes, I can support my students and help them learn. That that side of things is one of them. And the other one is um, a philosophy that I have, which is we don't have to translate the methods we have to translate the results. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is just because when you're teaching face-to-face -face or through the screen in real time, you teach it this way, it doesn't mean that you have to do that exact same thing as a asynchronous lesson, as a recorded lesson for inside your course or inside a group program. Really what we want is we want our students to be able to hit the result that that program or that particular lesson has. And it's kind of just thinking about things differently. And so I do a lot of work with my clients to just kind of, okay, let's think about the goals of the students. And if it's a 10-week program or a four-week program or a 16-week program, where, how do we march them along through that program? What results are their intermediate results? And how do we teach asynchronously through the screen or through lessons, um, through downloadables and pictures and things like that to get them to that, which may look very, very different than you do when you're in that classroom. And the other thing that we do is really take advantage of technology. We can do so much video recording. You can have your students record themselves on their phone playing whatever the assignment is, and they can send that to you. 
and you can play that back and talk through all of the corrections and you can do that in um, asynchronous time. So a lot of my clients will set up one day a week where they watch their student videos and they do all of the feedback for their students. So you kind of just change the way your calendar is set up. So you're creating content on certain days, you're interacting with your students on certain days, and you're, you're making it so that you're really in control of your schedule instead of the magic calendar app being in control of your schedule. <laughs> I, lo I love that. And that's definitely what I've transitioned into. I mean, this is my interview day, right? So I'm doing three interviews today and a couple other meetings and that's my focus. And then I can have the empty days that I need to do content, to do planning. And like you said, to do student interaction. And it is just a different way of thinking when you move online that at first is a little bit hard. Like we think, oh my gosh, they, they can't get the result unless it's in person because that's all we've ever taught. So that's mm -hmm. why I think someone like having someone like you is great because you can show them all the ways that they can translate what they've been doing. And I do think pictures are so key. Pictures can really draw conclusions for people that they can't get by you just talking through it. Yeah, absolutely. Demonstrations, pictures, and you know, you can you can kind of go and have fun with it. Think about how you like to learn and how you like to you know enjoy time. Like when you're not working, how do you like to consume content? Do you like to go on YouTube? Do you like to scroll through images? Like, I mean, just think about how you like to appreciate different things in the entertainment space because. That if you can translate something that you enjoy into a product that you're creating, you're going to enjoy that product that much more and be more passionate about it and be able to share it and feel really good about it. That brings to mind something. I don't, I don't know if you do this with your clients, but I'm curious. Do you help them incorporate some kind of gamification into their course or membership? Absolutely. Ooh, I, love I love it. <laughs> yes. Yes. So gamification is making it fun saying, okay, if you complete this exercise by this date, I'm going to give you whatever it is. I mean, this goes all the way back to elementary school where you got your gold stars. You know, <laughs> we are trained to work with deadlines and work with rewards. I mean, those are two very, very uh, critical things. You can make the gamification work so well in the education space when you're teaching people something. You can say simple things that doesn't cost you a whole lot. One of my favorite ones is finish these lessons and I will include you in my Instagram stories. I will include your thing, your clip in my Instagram stories. That takes basically no work. Mm -hmm. But it is such a cool thing that your teacher is sharing your work on their Instagram. Like, yeah, I, I'm about to, you know, because it's frustrating as a teacher, right? You see, you've got all this great content, the people, you know, the people want to learn it, but yet they're not doing it, right? So mm -hmm. I, I'm about to incorporate something in the first section of my academy that's going to be like a coffee challenge. So you know, when you do these five milestones and you show that you've done the work, you'll, we'll give you, we'll buy you a coffee at Starbucks. You know, it's not a lot, mm -hmm. right? But it's, it works. Cause I was in a program that did that. And I was like, I want that coffee. Like, I don't even know why, but I want it. <laughs> I'm yeah. My work. Absolutely. Anytime that you can dangle something at the end of a unit for your students. Again, it doesn't have to cost money. And that's why I use the Instagram story example because it helps you think differently about rewards. But as a student, they just want to be seen. They just want to know that they're making progress. They want to know that you care as much about their outcome as they did when they were signing up for your program. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even just a shout out within the community of the course mm -hmm, mm -hmm. could be cool. So yeah. yeah, I love that idea. I'm, I'm so glad you're incorporating that because I, I think, I mean, I certainly didn't think about it at first because I'm always like, well, but they're paying for this and, you know, they're going to be motivated because they're paying and they want this result, but it does really help to give them little, you know, 
little things, little breadcrumbs along the way that they can pick up. Yeah. And I mean, some of the ways that people do this as well is by not being able to just jump around within the course. You, you have to finish module one before you're allowed module two. Module two may be a whole lot more fun for the student, but they have to actually get through module one. So we reward them with module two, and then they can continue on in that way as well. Yeah. And that, you know, that's one thing about Thinkific or Teachable or, you know, using a platform like that, you can create that what they call drip content. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and basically keep people from getting to the next thing until they finish the thing before. Right. That's very cool. Um, so is there anything else that you find with artists, uh, musicians in particular, that is really holding them back from using tech? I've heard you say, you know, that people say tech is a four-letter word. And I <laughs> definitely have experienced that. With my students and with people that are emailing me all the time, they say things like, I, I really want to do this. I know I'm a good teacher, but I just don't think that I can handle the tech or I feel so behind, you know, I barely made it onto Facebook, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, the nice thing is, is first of all, you're not alone. I just want to say that you're not alone. There are people signing up for being, you know, for Thinkific, for Teachable, for all of these course delivery or learning management platforms every single day. And those people don't have any more experience with that than you do. And one of the advantages that a lot of musicians have is that you've used a microphone. In Mm -hmm. some way, shape, or form, you've used a microphone before, which means you're already ahead of some of people who have never used a microphone before. What else have you done in your life and business that sets you up for it? Well, you send an email to Brie, you listen to a podcast, you are already there. You are already further ahead than you realize. Think of all the small tech wins that you have had and just think of these as the next small tech wins. You don't have to bite off, I'm going to create this huge long campaign and funnels and this, that, whatever else. You just have to... Think about what you can do for your students and find a platform that allows you to feel comfortable easily. Watch a couple of webinars, watch a couple of videos that teach you how to use the basics of that. Master the basics and then add. You can always add an incremental. I mean, Brie, you just said it. You're just adding gamification now. That's not a level one thing. That is a level four or five thing that a lot of people add later on. To get started, you pick a platform, you do the bare minimum, and because you are already in the industry, you are already doing the work, you have a an audience ready to come on this journey with you. It's not like you have to go and say, okay, well, I am going to start teaching this instrument or this piece of music or this whatever it is and not have any street cred. You have street cred already. So just because the technology is new doesn't mean that everything else isn't, um, it, you know, isn't already established. Yeah, that, that is a really good point because in some ways, Tech is a much smaller hurdle to overcome than not having an audience. (laughs) You know, if you're starting from scratch, you've never taught anyone before, and all of a sudden you're just going to go online and try to suddenly teach this thing, that's way harder (laughs) than (laughs) being already a teacher that has your methodology, that you have got testimonials and referrals and people that already teach with you, and all you need to do is just do it in a different way it's not that bad. And I've seen it like my husband's a university professor. And of course, all of them had to go online this semester, you know, and some of them, especially the the older ones that weren't as up on technology, it was hard for them, but they did it. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it can be done. Yeah. Yeah. I have a 70 something year old harmonica teacher in my (laughs) portfolio and he is just so delightful and he just had such a ball learning all this stuff. And he kept coming back to me and asking me the same couple of questions every single time. And then one day he didn't ask me that question (laughs) because he figured it out. And so I just want to say if he could do it, that, you know, if you're listening and you want to do this, you can do it too. Mm, 
that's that's really exciting. That's awesome. Um, okay, is there anything that we didn't cover today that you wanted to make sure that people um, listening knew? I think that the biggest thing is kind of what I was just saying, that if you want to do this, if you want to gain more control over your schedule and leverage the talents that you've got online, then go for it. Create an online program of some kind. And online programs don't have to just be asynchronous courses, online learning courses that there's no interaction with you as the teacher. I know that's one thing that a lot of people are really afraid of is that if they go online with these group programs, that they're not going to be connected to the teacher. You as the teacher can decide how much contact your students have with you. If you want to have weekly calls with all of your students, like just a group call, you can build that into the program. You don't have to just completely be on the other side of the screen and not have any interaction with them when you do group programming and you do these kinds of things in the online space. So there's a lot of ways to structure it. And um, it's just a fun and exciting time. And I think that now is really an important time for there to be as many opportunities for people to bring music into their homes and into their lives as they can. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And there's you know, you may think, well, there's issues with the tech, right? If I want it, like you may do group lessons in the past, right? And people can't play together or can't sing together because of the lag. You don't have to do that, right? You could do a weekly like showcase where a few students perform for the other students, you know, but a way that you can still create a community that brings people together and allows you to connect with them It doesn't have to look like it does in person, but it can still be really powerful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when it comes to showcasing your students, you can do that in a number of really exciting ways that, I mean, we've all seen that people are putting together videos of, you know, virtual concerts and things like that. But you can do really fun things online when you stop thinking you can't. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's really cool because I'm in, I'm in this choir and they're putting together the Christmas concert and what they did for the promo, which I thought was really interesting is of course, you know, people were recording thing, things asynchronously, but what they did is they put everybody singing the same song together, whoops, same song together, but then they were, they each had a solo part instead of them all singing together. It would like went from this person to this person to this person. So they each got like a little solo, but it was all within the same song. And I thought that was really cool. Because it allowed each person to have their own spotlight, but not be, you know, totally self-conscious that they were doing the whole thing themselves, especially if they're like beginners or, or learners, that could be a really cool way to showcase your students. Yeah, there's lots and lots of ways. And I, I love working with creatives and people who, again, like just tear down the walls and say, what can I do? And we can come up with some really cool things. You don't have to be afraid of the technology. You don't have to think that you have to always just trade time for money and do one-on-one. And as soon as it's possible to get back in person with people, I'm jumping right at that. Don't think that way. You can definitely still do one-on-one in person when that becomes available again, but having your online programs set up and running is going to magnify and amplify your impact and your income. Yeah, because you can work with people anywhere. So why not do both? You know, if you love the in-person, I I have some friends that are voice teachers, they still love the interaction of the in-person and there's nothing wrong with that. But you don't have to teach every day, all day in person if that exhausts you. You know, do that for two days a week. And then the other days you're spending on your online students. Yes. It it could really, you know, revitalize you as a teacher to have those different mediums. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want Jamie to help you to tear down these tech walls, um, definitely reach out to her. And how can they do that? What's the best way for them to find you online? Best way is on Instagram. I'm Jamie Slutsky. And I'm sure that you will spell this out for everybody, but it's J-A-I-M-E-S-L-U-T-Z-K-Y. So yeah, Jamie Slutsky on Instagram. And my website is techofbusiness.com. Mm, okay. That's a little easier to spell. Techofbusiness.com. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. I love getting geeky about tech stuff. Um, In fact, in my 
in my academy, um, we have an entire call every month called Tech Talk Tuesday, just because I found that there's so much pain in relation to different te- all the different tech platforms that you need to learn and where's this button and you know especially things like on Instagram that are only on the phone and they're like well where did they put you know where do I click to get this thing and how are these people doing these things I don't know how to do it and it's like the most popular call that we have because there <laughs> is that pain point with musicians and me too like i occasionally have a question that i ask them like i cannot figure out how to do this <laughs> how do you do this so um don't ever feel shy that you you know that maybe you think you're the only one that has these question questions trust me you're not and someone like jamie is here to to help you and hold your hand so you don't have to figure it out because that's like a lot of hours that you don't need to spend. So go find her online and reach out to her if you'd like to talk to her about getting some help with your tech. Thanks so much, Jamie. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bree. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.